ओम भूरभुव स्वह तत्सूरवरेण्यम भर्गो देव सदीम धीयो यो न प्रचोदया ओम शांति 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 नमस्ते माय डियर फ्रेंड्स दिस इज सेकंड वीडियो ऑन विचार सागर ऑफ शिवामी निश्चला नंदा विचार सागर इज द मोस्ट इम्पॉर्टेंट बुक ऑन अद्वैता वेदांता इट इज ट्रांसलेटेड इन मोस्ट ऑफ द इंडियन लैंग्वेजेस एंड यू टॉक टू एनी साधु इन इंडिया अबाउट विचार सागर दे विल बी रेडी टू एक्सप्लेन द फिलोसफी ऑफ विचार सागर सो इट इज अ वेरी वेरी इम्पोर्टेंट बुक आई हैव स्टार्टेड मेकिंग वीडियो ऑन ओरिजिनल बुक ऑफ विचार सागर and simplified version of vichar sagar both in hindi and now i have started making videos on vichar sagar in english so on the ascertainment of reality and the happiness it yields introductory stanza i am that pure and infinite self who is bliss eternal manifested all pervading and the substratum of all that has name and form whom the intellect cannot discern but who discerns it imperishable without a beginning hari vishnu mahesh sun moon varun yam force dhanesh ganesh an object of meditation for devout sages everywhere who is all kindness and consciousness his associate am i thus to consider him as an associate is illusion or false knowledge who knows not him confounds the objective world for something real in the same way as a snake is created in a cord but who looks the world as poisonous as a snake is a real knower of self and such self is to be recognized as actionless pure and beautiful to him i offer my salutation to one acquainted with the mode of worship which a non dualist adopts the introductory stanza needs no explanation but it is otherwise with the generality of readers who may conclude it an height of impertinence thus to raise one's own self to the dignity of the supreme brahma the absolute and unknowable of western pantheist as the author evidently does in the opening line on this subject the panchadasi says self indicated by the signs of bliss sensiency etc is the impartite supreme self i am that self in this way is he to be worshiped but then brahma is an impersonality actionless without any attributes yet to 
differentiate it by the indications of felicity, intelligence, etc. may appear puzzling and inconsistent inasmuch as it virtually amounts to an admission of personality in impersonality. We find it distinctly laid down in all Vedantic works that this is neither inconsistent nor unauthoritative. In the Sarir Ka Sutras chapter 3 book 2 verse 11 and 33 Vyas expounds Brahma in the concluding portion of his chapter in that way as a pantheist the author is at perfect liberty with right and consistency in his side to put his Brahma in Hari, Vishnu, Mahesh, in short, anywhere and everywhere. For Brahma is here a first principle and not a personal God. As such, it is everywhere present and at all times even the meanest tadpole that thrives in the smallest accumulation of water collected in a roadside ditch has its Prabrahma equally <coughs> with the mightiest emperor that rules the mightiest nation on the surface of earth. Ob objects what is eternal bliss self-manifested all-pervading and substrate of name and form whom intellect cannot discern but who discerns it i am that pure self and infinite this is its paraphrase the purport is to establish non-duality that is to say the individual spirit or atma is non-different from the universal spirit parvarma the absolute after the manner of the transcendental vedic phrase that art thou or i am brahma etc but that supreme self or brahma has peculiar characterizing traits his predicate which are being set forth as follows he is joy self manifested all pervading and substrate of all that has name and form moreover intellect cannot discern him but he discerns it that is to say the function of a word's strength cannot influence the individual's intellect in such a manner as to help the cognition or perception of Brahma. But he can only be perceived by the indications of a word acting upon the function of the internal organ. A person whose intellect is faulty and impure cannot perceive him but one whose intellect is pure and faultless discovers him it is to be understood from this interpretation that a person pure in intellect knows the brahma not by the pervasion of the result but by the pervasion of the modification of the internal organ and as the light of a lamp discovers another object the modification of the internal organ has not a 
similar power of discovering the Brahma, but like a covered object discovered by breaking the cover which conceals it. So by removing the ignorance which rests on Brahma, it is discovered for its self-luminosity and therefore Brahma stands in no need of the intellect. He is the discoverer of all objects. Consequently, he is said to be not a subject of discovery for the intellect, though he discerns it. In this manner is established his self-luminosity. Moreover, Brahma is pure and infinite. These are the indications of differentiation. That is to say, if Brahma were only bliss, then it would be mistaken for material happiness or with the property of felicity which a Nyayika attributes to self to prevent such misconceptions. The blissfulness of Brahma is said to be eternal. Material happiness is non-eternal and the attribution of felicity to self is also non-eternal according to the Nyayikas. If Brahma were only eternal, then as then as ether, time and etc. are also regarded in Nyaya to be eternal. Consequently, there will be a pervasion of mistake. That is to say, Brahma would in that case be mistaken with ether, time and the rest. Hence, with the eternal Brahma, the indication of self luminosity is added because, because though ether is said to be eternal, yet its luminosity is not admitted in Nyaya. On the other hand, it is said to be insentient. Thus then, coupling luminosity and blissfulness as indications of Brahma with its eternal nature, all sources of fallacy and misconception are removed. For the luminosity of the sun and the luminosity of intelligence, a property of self can lay no claim of identity with Brahma as they are transient and non-eternal because the supporters of the transient theory of intelligence say all acts of consciousness follow like a continuous current of water in which a second conception succeeds a prior one and so on while Brahma is pervasion the sun is luminous but that luminosity is finite and not all pervading. A Nyayika does not admit the pervasion of self but looks upon him as finite. In the same way, the transient intelligence or consciousness is also regarded as finite and not all pervading. Therefore, Brahma has been described as self-luminous and all-pervading. If you say Brahma is only all-pervading then as ether, akas or space, time, quarters etc. are similarly regarded in Nyaya and as the different other schools, Prabhakar, Sankhya and etc. Put a similar 
construction on the properties of self, prakriti, etc. There is a likelihood of Brahma being mistaken with all and every one of them. Hence, to do away with such a misconception, Brahma's pervasion is coupled with substrate. That is to say, it is not only pervasion, but substrate of everything that exists. For name and form are indications of creation. Now, ether and the rest are pervasive, but they are not the substrate of name and form. Similarly, Inyaika and Prabhakar regard self, Atma, to be pervasive, but they do not admit him to be the substrate of name and form. Kapila looks upon his Prakirti in a similar light of pervasion, but not as the substrate of all things that have name and form. Thus then, its difference is clearly established by the indications set forth in the above manner and there is no chance for a mistake or misconception. Similarly, to regard Brahma as the substrate of name and form to open to misconception in as much as the illusion of a snake in a cord produces both name and form which are perfectly unreal. Hence, to prevent such a fallacy, it is said to be undiscernible by the intellect, but is the discoverer of that intellect, that is self-luminous. Now, coupling it with this one predicate, self-luminous precludes all sources of mistake with other substances set up by the other sects from the indications of Brahma. Moreover, according to the Vedanta in the illusory creation or supreme position of a snake in a cord, the substrate of the snake's name and form is said to be the intelligence associated with the rope and not the rope itself and that only ordinary or gross perception of the snake is produced for the time being to be removed after the discovery of mistake. Yet even here the instance does not clearly apply because for the presence of that one predicate already indicated with the other indications of Brahma undiscernible by the intellect. If Brahma were only admitted to be self-luminous then as there are worshippers who regard their object of worship as self-atma in the same light there is consequently a mistake of Brahma with self. To prevent it, Brahma is said to be pure. Now those worshippers regard self to be self-luminous, but then as he has the impurities of ignorance avidya present in him. Thus then by connecting the self-luminosity of Brahma with purity, the apparent contradiction is cleared. If it be affirmed that Brahma is pure only, then a source of fallacy crops up. For according to Kapila, Atma is regarded as pure, hence Brahma will be mistaken with self. To preclude it, Brahma has another indication and that is infinite. Now the author of the Sankhya philosophy 
does not take self to be infinite. Hence, this distinction is enough for the purpose of distinguishing Brahma from self. Time, place are all considered as indestructible in the Sankhya system, but all material substances dependent on them are prone to destruction, hence they are not infinite. But Brahma is infinite to the best sense of the term. It depends not on time, place, etc. Hence, indestructible. Though for the purpose of removing all unnatural inferences, it may be remarked that the connection of two such predicates as joy, eternal, etc. is enough. The introduction of several predicates has been used to help an inquirer of truth to know Brahma by its several indications from different standpoints. And I am that Brahma which has all these predicates. This is the purport of the stanza. But it may be alleged that in the introduction, the usual valedictory address ought to be made either to Vishnu, Shiva or the other Devas and to throw them into the shade and introduce self in this manner is improper. That imputation is cleared in the following verse. To a non-dualist who regards Brahma and Self to be non-different, what is more proper than that mistake as it is called here to be confirmed? It is the dictum of the Vedanta, Upanishads and forms the subject of the present treatise. But the doctrine of non-duality is in the opposite direction. Self is mistaken with Brahma and taken for such so that no separate cognition of the self remains. This is meant. Nothing was further from the author's mind than to introduce a contradiction in the opening passage of his work. He has taken pains to establish non-duality and yet to introduce duality is absurd. Next stanza. From Vishnu Mahesh, it is an infinite succession to law, nature, sun, moon, varuna, yama, shakti, dhanesh and ganesh. Like a never-ending sea with its continuous train of waves, Vishnu Mahesh and the rest are all a continued succession of devas indicated by the waves of the sea and infinite too and they are each and all of them equally identical with myself. Thus then in praising self they have all been duly praised and the impropriety of praising self is removed. But it may be said that Vishnu and Shiva can properly be looked upon as Iswara's waves and not of yours or yourself. Hence, it is necessary that the work must open with a praise of Iswara, as by watering the roots of a tree, its trunk and leaves are all satiated. So, by praising Iswara alone, all devas are praised and by praising your individual self, no praising of the devas can follow. But there is no such apprehension 
as will appear in the sequel immediately next stanza that kind god who is omniscient an object of contemplation for the wise whom to connect with and associate is false knowledge that kind iswara is contemplated by all devout sages and his <coughs> associate of maya is as unreal as a snake in a cord or a city created in a dream so that by seeking to praise him if self be duly praised it applies to him for to contrive his difference is only imaginary but that is what resembles the pure brahma and as you cannot claim an identity with it consequently it is proper that the impersonal brahma without attributes be duly mentioned in the introductory stanza and by speaking well of it all will be equally praised that cannot follow from the praising you from praising yourself but it is otherwise next stanza without its knowledge the world appears real but like the knowledge of a rope removing the snake its knowledge reduces the world to nothing and self is identical with it as ignorance of a rope produces a snake on it which is removed when all the parts of that rope are fully known so a full knowledge of brahma reduces the objective world into its normal condition of unreality and there is no more any hankering left either for the world or its goods and a man is so to speak on the road to emancipation and i am that pure brahma and there is no difference whatever between them when regarded in the light of a part and whole modified and modifier or worshipper and worshipped and in the absence of that difference there is likewise a want of the other subservient conditions or relations which of cause and luminosity container and contained consequently myself is proved to be without them so that by praising self brahma is duly praised now there is yet another difficulty you belong to the sect of dadu pantis who are worshippers of ramachandra and as such it is very proper that you should invoke a blessing from your guardian deity by duly propitiating him with the necessary praise or valediction for a satisfactory solution of this point the concluding lines of the verse say one must want a good perception and have good deeds to worship ram without motive i am that ram and him i offer my reverence that ram who is only to be worshiped by good deeds performed without a motive of reward either here or thereafter hereafter when only can a person have his perception cleared in a manner as to perceive him is non different from myself hence in the absence of an object of worship or of devotion to whom am i to offer my reverence that is why i pay my respects to no one or it means a person who for a clear perception of the supreme brahma has served ram with good actions without any aim of being benefited and whose self is non different from 
Parabrahma has no other object for his reverence as all are included in his self who is the abiding intelligence and in the absence of such another object different from self no proper worship can be tended to it remarks pre fetri the sutras their commentaries and other works in sanskrit there are many and several yet i speak in vernacular for them who are dull in intellect though the sanskrit is replete with the vedanta siddhanta and similar other works yet the present one cannot be termed futile in as much as persons of dull intellect will fail to profit by the instruction imparted in the learned language while no such apprehension needs to be entertained with regard to vichar sagar as it is written in the vernacular which man of ordinary caliber shall be able to comprehend hence for them it is useful by poets many works have been written in vernacular well known are they in the world but without seeing the vichar sagar doubts cannot be dispelled and so far as language is concerned there may be many other works like it but none of them can remove the doubts concerning the reality self which the vichar sagar alone is capable of doing for several of the authors have written their works after hearing and are therefore full of errors besides in some places they impart instruction in direct antagonism to the sacred writings owing to their authors in ability to comprehend their real significance as for instance the work known as pancha bhak pancha bhaka then again there are others who have written with a partial knowledge of the sacred writings such as atma bodh hence they are quite incompetent to clear away the doubts in regard to the atma spirit or seventh principle in man while there are others who have not thoroughly adopted the method of the vedanta moreover the present work is complete in itself it follows the vedanta text closely and is nowhere opposed to it it deals particularly on subjects that help knowledge of the self hence it is unlike the rest in the vernacular bhakka but superior to them all section 1 thus having the vedanta doctrine for its subject the present work is moved by similar considerations without them a seeker of knowledge will have no inclination for the work hence i proceed to consider them these are one the qualified person or fit vessel adhikari two the relation sambandha third the subject vishaya fourth the necessity to dispel 
ignorance concerning the non duality to be demonstrated and to acquire the blissfulness of brahma prayojana there are three defects in all subjects of the internal organ andhakarna namely mal vikshepa and avarna abstaining the mind from works done with the desire of reward will cleanse it of all impurities mal devotional exercises upasana will remove misapprehension vikshepa and knowledge concealment or want of apprehension avarna one free from impurity and misapprehension but only ignorant who is possessed of all the means is called a person qualified in <coughs> intellect one the qualified individual is a person who by the performing of actions without a motive of reward and devotional exercises have got rid of all impurities mal and misapprehension vikshepa and who is subject of one ignorance call it avarna concealment or want of apprehension and endowed with the four means of knowledge the four means sadhana are sadhana chatushta in sanskrit one discrimination between things eternal and non eternal that is transient it is called viveka two indifference to the enjoyment of reward in this life or the next vairagya three possession of quiescence self restraint faith concentration abstinence and endurance sat sampatti and four desire for emancipation mumukshutva one discrimination between eternal and non eternal is to know self to be eternal imperishable and actionless and is the only substance of his kind while the objective world is non eternal and perishable that is to say antagonistic in nature to self it is the basis of the other means for indifference and the rest are produced from it without it they are absent hence it is the source or cause of the other means from indifference to emancipation a says acquainted with the drift of the vedas calls him indifferent who bent on the attainment of a brahma discards all other things for they prevent his wish being realized too in difference to the enjoyment of reward in this life or the next this consists in an utter disregard for enjoyments either in this life or the next for as shown in the vedas they are the products of actions and actions are non eternal hence such enjoyments be it nectar or the blissful abode of heaven must necessarily be of short duration and with their cessation or destruction the individual will be hurled to rebirths all wise men there for discard them three 
क्विसेंस सेल्फ रेस्टोरेंट एंड द फोर अदर सब्सटेंसिस आर ए क्विसेंस समा बी सेल्फ रेस्टोरेंट दमा सी फेथ श्रद्धा डी कंसंट्रेशन ऑफ थॉट समाधाना ई एब्स्टिनेंस उपरति एफ एंडोरेंस तितिक्षा दे आर नाउ बीइंग डिफाइंड ए क्विसेंस और पैसिविटी समा इज टू कीप द माइंड अलूफ फ्रॉम सब्जेक्ट्स व्हिच स्टैंड इन द वे ऑफ अटेनिंग नॉलेज ऑफ सेल्फ वन possessed of it is called tranquil b self restraint dama consist in the restraining of the external organs of sense and a person who has so subdued his senses is justly called an intellectual hero c faith shraddha is to believe the utterance of the vedas and one's spiritual perceptor d concentration of thought samadhana is the distraction of all mental objects they distract the mind and hence prevent an individual from concentrating his mind already subjugated and turned away from sensuous objects on self e abstinence uparti is to abstain from all works after having been possessed of the four means of knowledge to look upon all sorts of enjoyments as poison or to abandon the prescribed acts in the manner laid down in the shastras by turning into an ascetic f endurance titiksha is to bear the extremes of heat and cold hunger and thirst pleasure and pain with equanimity these six substances constitute one of the means and are not reckoned so many by a person possessed of discrimination the acquisition of quiescence and the rest called the six substances is looked upon as one of the four means of practice to attain deliverance and not as so many distinct or new and a person possessing them is called one full of discrimination for they help to produce discrimination whereby an individual is enabled to distinguish the eternal from the non eternal four emancipation is to attain brahma and to destroy bondage what subjects a man to continued rebirths is called bondage one desirous of release is a prince of sages the attainment of brahma and destruction of evil or indications of emancipation or deliverance and to wish for them is known by the term desire of release mumuksha this word and emancipation are synonymous these are the four means of practice for acquiring self knowledge with the three a hearing sarvana b consideration manana c profound contemplation nididhyasana and the ascertaining of the 
real significance of that tat and thou tvam in the transcendental phrase that are that art thou tatu tatum <coughs> tatvamasi they are all together eight in number that is to say discrimination and the three others together with hearing consideration profound contemplation and the ascertainment of the real indication of that and thou non duality constitute the eight means for acquiring knowledge of self these eight are the internal well sacrifice and other offerings are the external means one engaged in the practice of the internal parts company with the external the eight means already mentioned commencing with discrimination and ending in the ascertainment of the real significance of that and thou are called internal while sacrifice and other similar works yaga are the external means of acquiring knowledge of self of these the last are to be avoided and the former alone to be practiced by a seeker of truth they are called internal because from hearing or knowing them apparent or visible results pratyaksha are produced discrimination and the other three are subservient to that hearing in as much as a dull person without them cannot ascertain the drift of the sacred writings from hearing them and in the same way hearing consideration and profound contemplation are subservient to knowledge of self for one cannot have any knowledge without them in like manner without the ascertainment of the real indication of the words that and thou the knowledge of non duality the individual and universal spirits are one cannot arise thus is determined the subserviency of the four means discrimination indifference etc to hearing and the subserviency of hearing consideration and contemplation to knowledge hence they are called the eight internal means the external means do not yield visible results but clear the mind of all ill wishes by hearing or pra practicing them for instance the sacrificial offerings and similar other works as a rule they are the ordinary practices of our daily concern in life and hence worldly and it is quite possible that a person engaged in their performance with a motive of reward becomes pure in mind but then they hurl him to consecutive rebirths hereafter to which they stand as cause for consumption of works is life and therefore what he has sown in this he must reap in the next and so on till final deliverance but for one who is without any desire of reaping any benefits from them or who assigns all actions to the lord iswara and acts as guided by him the above sacrifices and other works are 
merely conductive of making his mind pure and faultless hence their cause thus by his purity of mind he derives knowledge of self and hence they are its source and therefore they are called the external or distant while the internal are the proximate practice of the external means sacrifice and the rest or abandoning a wife children and property are for the acquisition of self knowledge they constitute a qualified person but for such a qualified person it is very unlikely that he shall be engaged in sacrifice and the above works hence they are distant discrimination and the rest behoving of a qualified individual are therefore near or proximate but then there is this difference that discrimination are beneficial to hearing as hearing is beneficial to knowledge in such a consideration of discrimination <coughs> hearing and the rest are comparatively speaking internal while with regard to the latter the former are external the discrimination and the rest have been described as the internal means for the acquisition of self knowledge and not the external means in all works yet they yield visible results in connection with hearing which are therefore as acceptable to a seeker of truth as hearing and the rest but that does not hold true with reference to sacrifice and similar works which are therefore unacceptable to him hence they are called internal in relation to sacrifice they are also internal here even they are recognized as the internal means of self knowledge and if it be duly considered it will be found that prior to such knowledge ascertainment of the real indication of that and thou in the transcendental phrase that art thou is the principal means for such knowledge <clears throat> moreover hearing and the rest are not alluded as such means for hearing sarvana is to ascertain the drift of the vedas by analysis and argument consideration manana is the unceasing reflection on the non duality of the individual self and second less reality brahma with arguments for and against profound contemplation nididhyasana is the continuance of ideas conformable to brahma to the exclusion of the notion of body and such other in consistent things with it meditation samadhi is a ripe condition of the above profound contemplation so that it is included in it and not a separate means now all these are not the direct means for practicing self knowledge but they cause the destruction of impossible and inconsistent ideas and thus clear the intellect of all its blemishes and frailties doubts are looked upon as impossible ideas and antagonistic are the inconsistent hearing of the vedanta doctrine clears away any lurking doubts concerning the proofs adduced to support the subject consideration removes such doubts in regard to 
what is to be proved. Whether the utterances of the Vedanta seek to expound the second less reality, Brahma, or something different, any doubts as to the proofs adduced in support of the subject is it seeks to demonstrate are cleared by hearing. Moreover, consideration removes all doubts as to whether non-duality or duality is true and of them non-duality is the subject that is to be explained. To know the body organs as real and to consider the individual self and Brahma as twin are called inconsistent ideas. They are antagonistic to self-knowledge and are removed by profound contemplation. In this way, hearing, consideration and profound contemplation destroy impossible and inconsistent ideas which stand in the way as obstacles to such knowledge. And inasmuch as such obstacles are removed by hearing, therefore the latter are looked upon as the source of knowledge and called so. But then they are not the direct or evident cause. The direct means for self-knowledge is to hear the utterances of the Vedanta, that is to say, to ascertain their drift as has already been explained while defining hearing. Vedantic utterances are of two kinds. One, avantara, two, mahavakya, or involved and transcendental. The first signifies such words as help the cognition of either the supreme self or the individual self. The second has reference to non-duality and establishes the oneness of the individual self and Brahma. Hence the words employed with this object are termed transcendental. The first produces knowledge marked by indivisibility as Brahma is existent while the second establishes knowledge marked by visible as I am Brahma. Thou art Brahma is pronounced by the teacher to create a relation between the pupil and Brahma which he no sooner perceives than he exclaims I am Brahma and thus acquires visible knowledge. Knowledge in which Brahma is established as a visibility. Inasmuch as the first personal pronoun used in conjunction with the subject of his knowledge, Brahma is involved in no mystery. But something tangible, apparent and visible and when such tangibility is extended to Brahma by the non-difference existing between the two, then the last also is rendered alike apparent and visible for this conditional relationship between the pupil who hears the words and the percepts conveyed by them through the means of hearing the words relating to that hearing are determined as the cause of knowledge with this difference that the included or involved words relating to that hearing are called the source of invisible knowledge while the transcendental under similar conditions are the source of visible knowledge. Thus, then, the transcendental words bring forth only visible and not invisible knowledge to everyone. But it has been alleged by the professor of another province, dis dissenter, 
that by means of hearing, consideration and profound contemplation in connection with the words is only produced the visible knowledge and by words only without hearing and the rest the invisible and not the visible knowledge. For it is sure if words will produce such visible knowledge then the necessity for hearing, consideration and profound contemplation ceases altogether. But this apprehension is unfounded in as much as they are needed for excluding or removing the impossible and inconsistent ideas which one may hold concerning the Brahma or its non-difference with the individual self. Hence we find though words help the cognition of the Brahma as visible and hearing and the rest are useful in the manner aforesaid as expounded in the Siddhanta. Yet one may contend that after the knowledge of the visible kind has been attained by a person, he is no more apt to blend it up with impossible or inconsistent ideas so that to an advocate of words as the only means helping the visible knowledge, the ascertainment of the real sig signification of the transcendental phrase that art thou is alone sufficient not only to produce such knowledge but also to exclude all impossible and inconsistent ideas and consequently hearing and the rest are futile and unnecessary. Now for the opposite doctrine, words only produce the invisible and practice of hearing, consideration and profound contemplation produces the visible knowledge. In such a view, hearing are not looked upon as futile but though this doctrine has been adopted by several authors it is not true for it is in the nature of words to discern dimly an object which is covered and they cannot reduce it to a visible condition as for instance the knowledge derivable from derivable drivable from the sacred writings about heaven and its devas, Indra and the rest. And when an object is uncovered, then it is rendered apparent or visible by words as well as inapparent or invisible. When words are used to indicate the existence of an uncovered object, then only the invisible knowledge is proved as the tenth person is. Here the neuter verb implies existence which refers to the tenth that is near. Hence words establish the invisible knowledge. But when words bring in the conception of a near object and reduce it to reduce it into the condition of this is then only visible knowledge is said to be established by them and not the invisible as for instance dasamata tenth dasmata tenth is in this way words establish the existence of tenth and render it visible similarly brahma for its being the all-pervading spirit present in every individual self is extremely close or near hence an included word rendered existent is capable of reducing Brahma into a visibility moreover like the example dasamata dasmata is Brahma as the soul of every being and therefore near is determined by the transcendental words so that such words cannot imply the invisible knowledge of Brahma but indicates visible knowledge and 
as has already been mentioned that when a thing is rendered visible there cannot exist any impossible or inconsistent ideas concerning it consequently hearing and the rest are futile such a view is inadmissible like raja in spite of a visible knowledge of his minister by name bhurchu who could not know he was his minister because his knowledge though visible was mixed with inconsistent ideas so the transcendental words help the cognition of brahma and render it apparent or visible but to such persons whose intellects are clouded with impossible and inconsistent ideas their blemishes stand in the stand in the way of knowledge and hearing and the rest are necessary for clearing the mind and one who has already been freed from them stands in no more need for hearing consideration and profound contemplation and he may not practice them thus in effect the transcendental words and phrases are the means of the acquisition of self knowledge not so hearing and the rest which simply destroy the obstacles to such knowledge so that they are called the cause then again hearing etc are him to be mistaken repeat the same process over and over always for getting to count the one who was counting thus finding the tenth person missing they take him for drowned and bewail at his loss meaning while another person coming up to them inquires of their grief and on being informed that their tenth is missing he points their mistake and shows that none of them is drowned they are now given vent to feelings of joy as before now they had been expressing their sorrow caused by discrimination and the rest consequently these last are called the means for practicing self knowledge and one endowed with the four means discrimination indifference quiescence and desire of release is called the qualified person adhikari to relation the relation between the subject and the work which treats it is characterized as the condition of the explainer and that thing to be explained here what explains is termed the explainer and that which is fit to be so explained is called the thing explained then again between the qualified person and the result phala is a relation characterized as a condition of obtainable prapya and obtainer prapka in as much as the result is obtainable to the qualified person who is there for the obtainer hence the obtainable prapya is that which is to be obtained and the obtainer or prapka as the individual who obtains it between the qualified person and consideration of the subject is a relation characterized as the consideration of an agent or doer and what ought to be done here the qualified person is the doer or agent and consideration or deliberation of a subject by the exercise of reason is what ought to be done kartavya therefore the agent is he who does makes performs or practices what he knows and what deserve to be so done is called kartavya or proper to be done between the work and knowledge is the relation characterized as the condition of product and producer because due deliberation of the work produces knowledge hence it is the it is the percent of knowledge which is a product derived from its study so that what produces is called the 
parent or producer and what is produced is called its product or offspring thus is relation set forth three the subject is the identity or oneness of the individual self with the universal spirit Burma, which is to be demonstrated in this work and which is the purport of all vedic utterances and one contending against such non-duality or who thinks them as twin is unwise and a disputation antagonist of the vedas fourth the necessity is the acquirement of felicity which is the essence of Burma and to be one with it and the removal of ignorance the source of the world as injurious to and destructive of it for ignorance is the progenitor of this vast expanse and an efficient cause of birth and death and its attendant miseries hence it is called injurious and harmful the attainment of supreme facility supreme facility by the removal of ignorance is called desire of release moksha which is the principal aim of the book hence it is called the supreme necessity while the intermediate avantar necessity is knowledge now the subject of desire or in other words what an individual desires to have is called supreme necessity or the chief purport of human life and as such desire is for the removal of misery and the acquirement of happiness it is applicable to all individual but it is the same as desire for release hence such desire for release is the supreme necessity or the principal aim of human life it cannot be construed as knowledge for knowledge is the means of procuring cessation of misery and happiness and not their actual destruction or acqu acquirement hence it is an intervening necessity now an intervening necessity is such as helps the attainment of the supreme necessity or the principal aim of such a nature is knowledge for the knowledge derived from a study of the work will procure emancipation which is the supreme necessity hence knowledge is determined as an intervening necessity but doubts may accrue as to the validity of what has just been said in the following wise the individual the individuated self is like supreme happiness itself to say the vedas then for him to procure what he has already got is absurd and inconsistent for that can refer to a thing which one has not in his possession and not to what he has to introduce the least trace of such a doubt is injurious to belief determine it well by repairing to a kind perceptor for instruction and it will be found that the apparent contradiction in the obtaining of that which has already been obtained resembles the mistake concerning a bangle said to be lost but which is all along present in the wrist the oppositionist might say that the destruction of fruitless things and acquirement of supreme facility is said to be the necessity for the work but such is impracticable because in the vedas jiva has been linked to supreme bliss which you also admit moreover acquirement can have reference to a thing which one has not to apply it otherwise is to create a contradiction for to obtain what has been always in possession is wholly impossible hence the acquirement of supreme bliss by self which is always such blissfulness himself is in every respect contradictory if anyone be so disposed to question then that need not create any disbelief in the necessity of the work but on the other hand he should repair to a kind perceptor for instruction on self-knowledge so that his doubts may be dispersed by illustrating example these examples are as one having a bangle in his wrist may through mistake caused by forgetfulness or absence of mind 
consider it to be lost he then exclaims i have lost my bengal but on discovering his mistake at the instance of another who points to his bengal already there he is apt to say i have got it here the bengal never left the possession of the owner yet he took it to be lost from mistake so that when it was pointed out he says i have got it in other words practicability of obtaining what is already in possession is thus established similarly by the force of ignorance a like mistake has to the supreme facility of a felicity of self is brought about and he is inclined to the belief self is unlike such bliss but brahma is and that a separation has taken place between him and brahma which by devotional exercises he gains over a large body of persons are laboring under this mistake if the greatest of the pandits will admit the individuated self and brahma as twin and not one he is no better than a dunce if such a dull person fortunately for good actions come to hear the percept of a professor on the vedantic doctrine and acquired that is to say become master of it by ascertaining its real significance signification then he exclaims i possess the supreme felicity through the kindness of the perceptor and the work itself now such an expression amounts to this that thou self is supreme blissfulness always and as such it did exist prior to my being initiated into the meaning teaching of the sacred scripture yet as i could not make it out that does not necessarily establish there was a want of it but on the contrary from the perceptions of his professor he has learnt it all and knows through intelligence such felicity to be his therefore he says he has now acquired the supreme felicity thus is established the necessity of the work for procuring happiness to one who was already its possessor though from ignorance he could not appreciate till stirred by the kind instruction of a professor and it need not imply any inconsistency similar similarly the destruction of unreal unearth is practicable as in the following illustration as a fact no snake exists in a cord at all yet illusion creates it which is removed no sooner the person comes to know that it is a bit of rope in the same way self is quite a separate entity from the world which is unreal like the snake yet from ignorance we confound him with it sometimes with the gross physical at other times with the subtle body soon sensuous organs vital ears intellect and nothing but by the advent of knowledge we discover our mistake and as this works seeks to impart the necessary instruction for attaining self knowledge consequently its necessity to stop what has already ceased to exist and to procure that which one is already master of is fully established and that does not imply any contradiction now cessation of the world with its cause ignorance and the acquirement of supreme blissfulness is the purport of the work but from what has already been said this is clearly impossible for cessation means destruction and the two words are convertible terms so that they reduce a thing to a condition of non existence as the existence and non existence of desire for release are both expounded by them if we say that it causes the cessation of a useless thing then such cessation reduces it into a condition of non existence so the acquirement of felicity refers to a condition of existence hence both of them cannot be present at one and the same time in the same object for want and non want or existence 
and non existence are antagonistic of each other hence they cannot be present at one and the same time in the same substance thus then one may say the necessity for the work is not clearly established to such a contention the reply is between cessation of the world and its occupation the difference is nil just as the cessation of the snake in the cord is its knowledge the removal or destruction of ignorance and its product the world is possession of brahma that is knowledge of self hence between such knowledge and the removal of ignorance the difference is nil just as the removal or destruction of the snake in a bit of cord is to possess a knowledge of it that is proceeds from knowledge a cord knowing a cord thoroughly thus then the destruction of all fancied or imaginary objects in a manner resembles an occupation of them and the two are non different according to the opinion of the commentator hence the destruction of this apparent and tangible objective world which is also called fruitless for it yields no result is brahma itself for brahma which occupies it all is essentially existent and its destruction indicating the same existence for they have been shown to be equal and things which are equal to one another are equal to the same thing here existence is the same thing and brahma and destruction of the world with its cause ignorance be equal they both refer to existence the necessity of the work is established thou kind guru deliver him at once from the chain of consecutive rebirths who reads the first section thus are the moving considerations ordinarily declared so i conclude this video at this stage next video will start with section 2 thank you <laughs> namaskar